spots throughout the country you had these things going and reported in various articles in the paper. That's what it was. You were having dumps, sudden little cracks or dumps of energy into the atmosphere which are making these popping sounds. The other thing that you can have them doing is you can have them being dumped into the ground and so you can have a series of little micro quakes, particularly when they're in areas where you normally don't get those things. Now on the micro quakes in the ground, you will pick them up with a seismograph uh, they won't look all that much different from the uh, small microquakes that you get in nature anyway. But the micro airquakes will be significant. Now, they apparently took about three months or so to adjust this whole network in and get it all set and working right to their satisfaction. And then I'm convinced personally, it's my personal opinion, and I'm convinced that they are responsible to a great degree for giving us our beautiful floods that we had in the early spring of 1983 that caused a lot of flood damage here and there everywhere. When you say they, you are speaking I'm of the Soviets. I'm talking about the Russians. This is a Russian weapon and it's coming from Russia and it's being used on us over North America, in my opinion. This is not to be confused with the ELF transmitter. No, sir. This is not ELF. Now, understand, if you want to disguise the thing, you can put a little ELF in it, ordinary stuff that you can pick up, and you'll think you're looking at the Russian woodpecker and you won't know about the other stuff. Now, it turns out that water vapor, or water in the air, which is not really vapor, it's in droplet form, uh, where they tell us it forms around a little particle of dust, you have a water drop, and if you're high enough in the atmosphere, of course, it freezes. You have a little, little particle of ice around the dust drop. But these little particles of water or particles of ice in the atmosphere are very interactive with this scalar wave stuff. They act as little interferometers and they do react to the scalar wave stuff. And so the water itself in the air and in the form of clouds does move and form patterns when very strong uh, scalar wave engineering is being done or energy of this nature is being created in that region when you have the interference pattern. Okay, the first thing we did, we had an actual sighting, a friend of, of mine and I, over Huntsville. We saw this grid pattern actually being adjusted in, and it persisted in the sky for over half a day. Now, that's a peg point for number one, fit, that fit very well in a time frame with the, uh, after the spring floods and all, getting ready for adjustment in the winter weather. Okay, after they got it adjusted and gave us the floods, the way that you can swing a cloud mass is once I have it adjusted in over an area, if I now turn my transmitter slowly, and I can turn them in any pattern I figure out to do, it's as if I move slowly that whole grid pattern. I can, and with phasing, I can make parts of it move. And so I can do things like reaching up and capturing uh, the pressure areas and moving the jet stream itself down so that uh, the classic pattern emerges. What we had in all this bad weather, we had this big jet stream dip very far down, coming in over from California, coming in over Texas and all, and then roaring up along the uh, ridge back of the northeast. And so it roared through the south and on up uh, parallel to the eastern coast. And we had storm after storm after storm roar through with that pattern along the bent and deviated jet streams of the upper atmosphere. Uh, California, for example, if you established a few blocking patterns, you had storms which came and hammered at the coast and hammered and hammered and hammered, uh, coming the same way. So that gave California a good show. Now, another pattern that you will find forming, and let's see, I'll have to give you a, a, a visualization here to get a hold of what I'm talking about. I want you to imagine now a checkerboard uh, where we've laid everything off in little squares. Now, in the center of, that's the wave diffraction pattern sitting up in the sky over North America. In the center of each little square, we're creating ordinary energy. You can put a detector in there, you can detect it. And by the way, the underground net went bananas in the United States. They, uh, people were calling me from all over with the uh, ELF and other kinds of things they were picking up. And in fact, what they thought was the U.S. government was doing this. And I told them that was nonsense. The government had not built a bunch of transmitters all over the U.S. Explain whenever you say underground net, Tom. Uh, the people who are a little bit off the orthodox pattern, uh, 
track and who do measurements out in the field and measure the Soviet woodpecker signals and measure uh, what kind of signals out there and who's trying to do what to who. Mm -hmm. Trying to make uh, some sense out of it and trying to put it together and find out what's going on. Private citizens. Uh, Private citizens. Connected yeah. And they, they picked up these... Uh, this energy, which is in the form of frequencies in the middle of each one of these grid zones, they picked that up all over the country. And so they thought that somebody had built an enormous number of transmitters throughout the U.S., but that's not the case. But it gives you the same effect as if the Russians had been permitted to come into the United States as if they had built a transmitter in the center of each one of these little grid zones. In other words, I've been calling that a virtual transmitter. The reason is... You have ordinary energy there, just like comes out of a, any ordinary transmitter. You can measure it, you can detect it, and it has real effects. And so we had that sitting all over the United States. Now, the next thing that, to visualize in each little square, visualize now a little mountaintop sticking up, and that's your energy sitting in that square. So what you're looking at on the checkerboard now is all of these squares with all of these little mountaintops, uh, these little... Um, all, almost uh, triangular shaped things or cone shaped things sitting all over it. So you're looking at a whole bunch of little cone shaped things sitting all over North America and that represents the energy in sitting in each grid. Okay, each around each one of those cones uh, depending on how they're transmitting the clouds will react. There are two kinds of reactions that will occur, and you can look up in the sky for yourself, and if you're lucky, you'll see one of these patterns. I've seen about seven so far. I've been successful in photographing one. I finally got a, had a camera with me when, I, when another one appeared over Huntsville, and I got that one's picture. But the signature to look for, the first one, is around where the cone of energy is, the clouds will form about two-thirds of a circle, about five miles in diameter. A little thin line of clouds will form this very unusual almost circle, about two-thirds of a circle. And then radially straight away from where the center would be, there will be long, thin lines of clouds running 15 or 20 miles. And you're looking at something that looks like almost like the old rising sun symbol in, in, of Japan in World War II. Only a piece of it is missing. You're looking at maybe a half or two-thirds of a circle with these radials running directly away, these long, thin lines, very straight of clouds, very unusual formation. Going out in all directions from the uh, little... Radially from the support would be the center of that little two-thirds of a circle. Okay, mm -hmm. now, when you see that, that is not a natural formation. Now, if you've looked at the sky very much, you realize that clouds do form striated clouds. That's a well-known uh, type of cloud. <clears throat> there are many types of striated clouds. We are not talking about those normal striated clouds at all. This is very abnormal. You can't mistake it once you ever see it. That's the first pattern. What I call the giant radial. It's just a circle almost circle, about five miles in diameter, very thin line of clouds making about two-thirds of a circle. Then radially away from that, straight lines, very straight and very long, 15 or 20 miles long, radiating away from what would be the center of that circle, straight away in, in a radial direction. Now, if the energy is even stronger, what you'll have is the energy will spill out past the checkerboard border in one of these where you're putting the interference in and between two of these conical places or two of the things that are forming the giant radials, two of them will get together. When that happens, the inner circle will disappear. And so you have the same pattern you just had with a, a giant radial coming out and on the other end of it, there is another giant radial pointing back into another a center. Only the circle in the center is now missing. In this case, the line of clouds is just a little bit fatter. It's about three times as, as thick as the other line of clouds. And now you're looking at two of them, which are, will be uh, anywhere from 20 to 30, even 40 miles apart, which will be moving along in the sky. Uh, the one I saw was moving, uh, as best I could estimate it, about 25 miles an hour. And what you're looking at is you're looking at a part of the grid where the energy is being formed and you're looking at a very, very slow rotation of this <clears throat> occurring by uh, <clears throat> movements on the transmitters coming from Russia. And what we're doing with that is we're capturing 
entire cloud masses and moving them right along to control the weather. And we're, of course, uh, uh, changing the pressure in the air, and we can do weather engineering that way. Now, <clears throat> I took off from a trip to California. I took off from Huntington Beach, and I had to leave very early to catch the airplane. This was in December, and it was prior to that extreme cold snap we had that broke so many records in the country. <clears throat> As I left Huntington Beach, there was a giant radio sitting right over Huntington Beach. As I got on the airplane then, finally, and came on out to uh, coming into Memphis, when I was about 400 miles from Memphis on a United flight, uh, at sitting up at about 30,000 feet was an absolutely flawlessly perfect giant radial. I flew right over it. I, we were up at about 35,000. And so I was about 5,000 feet above this thing looking right out at it, an absolutely perfect specimen, and I didn't have a camera with me. But anyway, on the same trip, I saw two of them <clears throat> very far apart in the United States, one halfway across the United States from the other. I've seen three or four here over... Huntsville, Alabama, and I saw one in Florida in October on a trip with another person there. We saw a, a giant radial sitting off down in Florida. Uh, the next morning we saw one in southern Alabama, <clears throat> which preceded uh, quite a bit of violent thunderstorm activity, including some tornado activity in south Alabama. If you twist the weather currents around, you're going to get some tornadoes in the right season. So you can augment the tornado activity you can augment the rain activity. You can move great masses of clouds, great cloud banks, over, great cloud covers over a large part of the United States. And you can actually change the jet stream itself and change the pressure areas. And then by very slow rotation, so that you don't slip out and lose the stuff you're capturing halfway around the world, you can move those cloud masses and influence the weather substantially. <clears throat> and in my opinion, that's been going on over our head. Uh...